Amen. Pastor Billy, didn't we decide we were going to go with the secret sauce rather than magic? Isn't that what we decided? I mean, I could we said gospel. You know, last week he said gospel communities. That's where the magic happens. And then we decided now we weren't going to go with magic. We're going to go with secret sauce. But what did you go with today? The good stuff. That's where the good stuff happens. I like that maybe even better. That is where the good stuff happens. Many, uh, uh, let, me, let me use a different uh, adjective or uh, let me use a, a phrase and say that a high percentage of you um, are, are in gospel communities right now, and I'm just, I'm proud of you, proud of you for doing that. And, uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a good semester so far for our gospel communities. We have a, a men's group that I lead. We've got a ladies group that Priscilla leads. We've got mixed, uh, what do you call those, co-ed groups that, that, that meet, meet around town, and it's been good. It's been good. We consider, for those of you that have high school students and middle, middle school students, we consider that... Uh, the icon, our youth ministry, is under the umbrella of gospel communities. You know, it's a connection point for our youth, for our, for our students. And so uh, across the board, people are getting connected here in, in our church, and so I'm excited about that. All right, so we're starting a new book. Uh, same same uh, sermon series uh, called Letters from a Prison Cell. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote... Uh, a number of letters, not just these two. Uh, he wrote other letters while he was in prison. Uh, but these two letters, uh, to Philemon, we already studied it. That's last week. We're, we're, we're done with that. And now this letter to the church in Colossae. Let me remind you, because um, we're going to talk about this some today, that, that Paul wrote numerous. In fact, uh, he's, uh, he's credited with 13 letters uh, in the Bible, 13 of the books of the Bible, 13. Keep that in, keep that in your mind because we're going to talk more about that. There are letters or books that we know he wrote that didn't make it into the canon of the Bible, so we don't consider them Scripture. For instance, uh, he mentions at one point, the letter that I wrote to Laodicea, uh, we're going to talk about Laodicea. He says, get that letter and read it. He, he, t- he tells the, Col- the, the Colossians, get that letter and read it. And, and in the meantime, send your letter over to Laodicea and let them read the letter I wrote you. Isn't that interesting? Now, we don't have the letter. It's not extant. It's not in existence. It didn't make it into the Bible. But he did write a letter to the church in Laodicea, wrote a letter to, Coloss- to, to the church in Colossae, he told them to trade it. He did a lot of writing. He, 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 uh, he did a lot of writing to these churches uh, and developed the theology that we have. In fact, as Christians, the, the, the deep thoughts, thoughts on God, theology, the deep thoughts that we have regarding God, if we did not have Paul's writing in the New Testament, um, we wouldn't have the developed thoughts that we have regarding God. Um, our theology, how we see God and salvation and grace, how how we see election and e- e- eternity, eternal glorification, and how, how we see so many things uh, are dependent upon, dependent upon the letters that Paul wrote. It would, it would leave a big hole in our understanding of who God is and our relationship with God. There would be a big hole left if we somehow were able to remove uh, Paul's writings are just that important. So, I want us to, as we, as we now look at this second letter, the letter to a church, because the first letter that we studied, uh, that we finished studying last week was to one individual and to his house church. This is a different letter, and so I want us to sort of clear our minds uh, get ready for some new content, some new material, some new thoughts, realizing that there, there, is, there is definitely uh, some, some overlap. But new, this is a new book, and so here's, here's what's significant, significant about that. There's a new context. Colossae is a different place. I mean, it's it actually, uh, Philemon lived in Colossae, but it's, this is a group, a people, a church. Uh, there's a new introduction. There's uh, new background material. Um, here's what it's about. I'm going to give you. A, I'm going to give you a statement that, that that is referencing the entire book that we're going to study over the next seven or eight weeks. Uh, N.T. Wright, Dr. Wright wrote this. He said, he said of the book, 
written to Colossians. I think we have this. He says, um, here's what's going on. Writing to a young church, discovering what it was like to believe in Christ Jesus and to follow him, Paul shares their sense of wonder as he encourages them to explore the treasures of the gospel and to order their lives accordingly. I'm going to break that down for you, and that may be too much to swallow right now, but this is what we're going to be talking about over the next seven or eight weeks. So here's what he's saying. Number one, this is a young church. I think we have these points. Number one, this is a young church. And so that's the context. We need to understand that. Young, young meaning they, the, the church itself had only been around a few years. I don't mean that it was made up of young people, but it's a young church in the sense that they had just planted. Epaphras had just planted this church perhaps a few years ago, so they're young in their faith. They weren't people coming from other churches to this church. They were people that were, they were pagans. They, were, they had followed other false religions. Uh, they had been, uh, some of them had been uh, uh, following the, the, the tradition of Judaism. And now, brand new church. They had just come to faith. So it's a group of people that hadn't been following Jesus that long. And they didn't have the entire Bible to teach them how to think on Jesus. And so they're waiting for this letter to come from Paul to understand how to think on about Jesus. A young church, number two, discovering what it means to believe in Jesus. Because they, they didn't have a Bible. Uh, they only had the Old Testament, right? And then they had these letters that were coming in from, from Paul. Uh, but they didn't have this fully developed understanding of who Jesus is. So they're a young church, discovering what it means to believe in Jesus. Third, discovering what it means to follow Him. Pretty self-explanatory. Number four, Paul shares his sense of awe in the Father's work. It's like what I did just a minute ago when I said, you know, I'm so proud of you guys. You, 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 you're getting in, invested in gospel communities and you're, you're taking communities seriously. Now, I didn't do that. Uh, that wasn't like a, an, a, a fake so that I could use it as an example right now. In fact, that's not even in my, in my manuscript, but that is an example. Just like I did that, I said to you a few minutes ago, you guys are doing good. You're in gospel communities. In the letter in the, we're gonna, that we're going to study over the next seven weeks, Paul does that. He talks about, man, you guys are doing so well. I'm so proud of you. Here's why I'm proud of you. Okay, then the next, next point, he encourages them to explore the treasures of the gospel. We'll talk more about that. And then last, he encourages them to, as they explore the treasures of the gospel, to reorder their lives accordingly. Look, as we come together here at River Church each and every week, if we are not, if, if I'm not encouraging you each and every week to, to think on how you might reorder your life according to Scripture, then I'm not doing my job. It's important for me as your pastor to encourage you and tell you that I, I believe Jesus is proud of you and you're doing good if I really think you're doing good, and I, and I do. But it is also important for me to say, in light of what we've read today in Scripture, perhaps we need to reorder our lives. We think, think differently on how we invest our emotions and our time and our, our money and our space and everything about us. Perhaps we need to reorder our lives according to Scriptures. So that's what, that's what we're going to be looking at. That's kind of a summary of what we're going to be studying over the next seven or eight weeks This is a particular letter. Think on this now. We often miss what I'm about to say when we study God's Word. This is a particular letter written to a particular church. It's written at a very specific time in history. The very early days of the the formation of this church. And we should read it as such, as though it's very particular. If you are, if you are a person who studies your Bible, and I know that, that, that some of you are, if you're a person who studies your Bible regularly, and you, like to, and you, you, you might say this, and this is a good statement, you might, you might say, Pastor Ernie, I like to go, go down deep in Scripture. I like to really drill down deep. Then, then let me encourage you. This may be a bit of a caution as well. Let me encourage you. When you study God's Word, you should, you should determine and understand the context the background, the history, because if you don't, you turn it into some letter that was just written to 21st century uh, Westerners, and it really was never that in the first place. You go there after you look at the actual context 
of the day. So again, this is a particular letter written at a particular time to a particular church, and we need to, we need to talk about that. The worldwide backdrop, just so you know what's going on, right now, Paul says that the gospel that is the story of Jesus, that's what we mean by the gospel, the story of Jesus, his death, burial, his coming to, to earth, his, his, his ministry here on earth, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to heaven, his saving work on our behalf, the life of Jesus. That's the gospel. Paul tells them early on in the letter, you'll see, like, he says, hey, just like the gospel has come to you um, in Colossae, and now your lives are being changed accordingly and you're becoming Christ followers. He says this, all over the world, meaning the Roman world, the known world, all over the world, that is happening. It's spreading all over the world just like it has spread to Colossae. Now, does that mean that the majority of Roman citizens have become Christians? By no means. In fact, Christians uh, were, were beaten down. They were small pockets, small churches surrounded by larger secular society. Christians in that day were largely thinking about eternity and heaven and home. Why? Because they weren't really players on this earth. They weren't really significant. They weren't really people of, for the most part, of means, people of influence, movers and shakers. They really weren't. They were these small pockets of relatively, by the world standards, insignificant groups of people, but they were just, in very anonymous, inconspicuous ways, they were popping up all over the known Roman world. And that's happening in Colossae as well. He says to them, and you'll see this in a minute, he says, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. And then last background before we read, Put, the, put Epaphras' name up. I want to remind you who Epaphras is. Epaphras uh, was in the last book, the book of, of Philemon that we just studied. He is from Colossae. He is one of Paul's dear traveling companions. He is one of Paul's dear uh, ministry companions. And he is a church planter, just like Paul and he most probably planted this church in Colossae. He was from there. He'd gone back there after he became a Christian. He told some of his friends, some, some of his hometown crew about Jesus. They had been converted to uh, Christianity, and now they have this church, this upstart young church that doesn't know exactly what they're doing, but they're faithful people, faithful men and women. With that as the background, let's jump right in. We're going to read eight verses today. I was going to preach on 14, just too much material, so I cut it down to eight. If you would follow along silently, I'll read out loud. Colossians chapter 1. As we start this new voyage, let me pray for us first. God, I do pray that you would faithfully and graciously uh, give us new thoughts to think as we undertake this new study. God, would you reorder our priorities? Would you reorder our lives, would you speak clearly to us here at River Church through this ancient writing to the church in Colossae? Would you, would you change us and move in our lives over the next couple of months? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, here we go. Colossians from the beginning of the letter. It reads, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven, about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it 
and truly understood God's grace. Verse 7, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. So we'll stop right there for today. Um, So, these first two verses, the very first two verses that we read, are really interesting. I find them interesting. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, it's like from and to, right? Like from Paul and, Paul and to, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. So, letters today, when you write a letter, if you even write letters, when you write letters today, for the most part, you, um, you have the sender's name, not you, when you write the letter, at the, at the end, right? You know, sincerely, and then you put your name. Well, in Paul's day, it was a little different. This isn't just true of Paul's writing, but just in general, letters from that day. Because we've got secular letters. We have other letters that are, that, that are extant from that day. And, and, and generally, in that culture, it was, it, it was opposite. The sender would immediately identify himself at the onset of the letter. Now, he would typically close it out by mentioning himself again, but he would, at the onset of the letter, Paul an apostle, that's how you wrote letters. So it wasn't odd that he started with his own name rather than starting with the recipient's name, which is how we write, right? To George, you know. Well, back then, you started with your own name. And, and, and the way he introduces himself in this letter, what does he say? Look at it again. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. By the way, the next eight weeks, we're going to be unpacking this word for word. So I hope you'll bring your Bible. I hope you'll bring a notepad. I hope you'll get something out of this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, he says. Now, that is not the way that he introduced himself in Philemon, the last book that we studied. Do you remember how he did that? He was, very, he was somewhat appropriately self-deprecating and humble. He was trying to speak into Philemon's life. You remember that? So he did not introduce himself as Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, which is a somewhat confident uh, introduction. Back then, in that, in that letter, he said, uh, I, I'm Paul, I'm, I'm a, a servant uh, or, or a slave. He used both both descriptions of Christ Jesus, and and so he was he was trying to he was trying to solicit a voluntary response out of Philemon. So he was coming at Philemon with 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 with, uh, with humility. In this letter, still the same humble Paul, but there's more confidence in it. Paul, an apostle. Now you should know that that of the thirteen books or, or letters that Paul wrote, thirteen books or letters that he wrote. Um, Nine of them, he starts this way, Paul, an apostle. There are only four, Philemon being one of them, four where he doesn't refer to himself as an apostle. So let's talk about what that means. If Paul says, I'm an apostle, what does that mean? If if your understanding of apostle is is the the, the 12 12 men that followed Jesus um, in his his lifetime and and they're sitting around the, the table, you know, at the... At the, the last at the last supper and they were they were there uh, although one by one they left him but they were there when Jesus was was tried and crucified and and ultimately they're all gone and we just have John uh, the, the apostle there if that's your understanding of the apostle that's an accurate understanding of the word that word gets thrown around and used all different ways in modern day, especially America. But, but really, the, most, the, the tightest definition of, of what is an apostle would be, in the Bible, it seems to be these men who followed Jesus around for three years, his closest confidant. It's an official designation given to certain, uh, certain leading individuals in the early church. As I already said, there were 12 of them, but what, why, why, what's significant about that number 12? Well, it went down to 11. Why? Because you remember Judas Iscariot was one of the apostles, oddly, uh, 
he betrayed Jesus, then he went out and he hanged himself, took his own life, so then there were 11. I say that's a significant number. I don't know exactly why, but it seems to be a significant number because do you remember what they did in, early on in the church? They decided, we need to replace Judas Iscariot. Now, Paul wasn't even in the picture yet, so we said, well, they, we need to replace him because we've got to have 12 for some reason. I don't know why. So, so then they, they chose a, a replacement, uh, Matthias, so there were 12 again. And, in the, and then Paul, in his ministry years, he takes on this title, like the 13th apostle. And in 1 Corinthians uh, 5, or 15 rather, he refers to himself as one untimely born. What do you think that means? The NLT says it this way. I'm the last of the, the apostles. There were 12 of them. I'm the 13th, although he never refers to himself as the 13th apostle, but he refers to him as the last of the apostles. And he says this, it's as though I was born at the wrong time. Here's another de uh, definition. Uh, Dr. Moo says that uh, apostle is this. An apostle is a person called by Christ himself, Understand that, like Jesus looked him in the eye and called him himself. A person called by Christ himself to represent Christ and proclaim Christ and thereby serve as the foundation of the new people of God. Now, different pastors have different definitions of uh, apostle. I'm really comfortable with this definition. Somebody who Jesus actually looked in the face called him to found to found the church a couple of thousand years ago those 12 or 13 well 13 with Paul 13 apostles and Paul is one of them now going on verse 1 and 2 he mentions Timothy who is this Timothy we know Timothy to be this dear younger church uh church planter um I'll just just so you have some kind of a picture in your mind if you maybe think of like uh, me as an older church planter, pastor, and Pastor Billy is a younger pastor. Uh, there's that sort of relationship. They're both esteemed. They're, they're, they're both learned. Uh, he, he mentions Timothy. He says, he says uh, Timothy and I are right. Now, that does not mean that Timothy penned every word or that they co-authored it in the sense that we might think co-author. Probably what's going on here is less than a co-author uh, but more than a, an esteemed scribe, uh, Timothy, like, he lived and breathed the older man, apostles, uh, uh, Paul, Paul's experiences. And so he could probably finish um, the Apostle Paul's sentences. He could probably intuitively write on Paul's behalf. He is the most prominent of the Apostle Paul's traveling companions and ministry partners, fellow workers. The affection between two, the two of them is, is very well known. Um, so, um, he somehow participated in the writing of this letter. Going on now to the recipients of the letter in, uh, in verse uh, 2, he says, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul is stressing, he say, he's stressing, you aren't just an anonymous group of people, um, you aren't just comers and goers, you know, in, in, in the church, um, especially in the modern church, there's that struggle of who is in the church, who really is a part of the church, who's who just a visitor, who's really in it, who's really drilling down deep, who's really committed Who's, who's just here today and gone tomorrow? Paul is stressing here when he says, brothers and sisters. You know, I used to think that phrase, like brother, brother, brother Randy, if you're, if you, nobody, maybe three, three or four people, four or five people in this room even know what I'm talking, talking about when I say this, but, but a pastor many, many decades ago, his name was Brother Bob, Brother Bob Clements, and we used to call him Brother Bob. When the new pastor came to town, we called him pastor, but the old pastor, we called him brother, brother Bob. And I used to think that was such an old and frumpy and southern hick sort of a, like, why are you calling me brother and sister? Like, like I mean, that's just friends will do. Uh, 
But you know, Paul, he uses different contexts, I know, but he uses that familial language of brother and sister on purpose. The word adelphoi in, in, in Greek is referencing brother and sister. Some translations just say brothers. I think the NIV got it right when they say brothers and sisters because that's what Paul is talking about. He's not talking about some gender. He's not, he's, he's, what he's saying is we're family. He's not just talking to brothers, just talking to sisters. He's saying this, this sense of like you're really family in the church, brothers and sisters. He's stressing the intimacy of the relationships in the church. And if you never experienced that in the church, you've always been kind of a fringe person, but you've never experienced true brotherhood and sisterhood in the church, then I think you're missing out to some degree. I think that there's more for you to experience in the church. The church. And those of you, and this is many of you, those of you that have experienced that, currently are experiencing that, you know what I mean? Like, this isn't just a community of like minded people. We're family. If you've experienced that in the church or you are currently experiencing that, then you know what I mean. It's a deep, precious thing. And that is what Paul is talking about. And here's one of the really significant aspects of being family in a church. A family must, must, must take on the, the attitudes and the actions that are necessary to remain unified. See, if you're not a family, you, then, then, then if, if, we're not, if we're not like-minded in something, they may be like, you know what, I'm going to go to my camp, and, and you can go to your camp, and we'll just, we'll just agree to disagree. Like, I'll, I'll be in this, whatever, just, we'll, right, we'll, so this, I'll be in this political camp, and I'll, I'll be good over here, and you can be in this political camp, and you can be good over there, and we'll get together for, for, uh, for dinner from time to time, and we'll just agree not to talk about politics, but we can just be in our own camps. But see, if church is a family, then you can't afford to do that. You have to take on attitudes and actions that say, we're going to remain a family. We're going to be unified. We're not just going to agree to disagree and go our own ways and be amiable about it. No, we are going to live and breathe and eat and be unified as a family. We don't just agree to disagree. We have to work on our attitudes, work on our actions so that we can continue to be a family. And then he refers to them, not just, he doesn't just say brothers and sisters in Christ. He goes on and he says, or maybe it's before, uh, no, go, go back to that verse. I'm, there you go. He says, uh, yeah, before he says faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, this is what I want to talk about. He says, to God's holy people in Colossae. And that is such an esteeming description if you really think about that. He says, to God's holy people. Yet what he will seek to esta- uh, what he will s- seek to establish in this letter, uh, th- this term, holy people, he is using to refer to the whole church. Understand that? He's not just saying, he just, he's not just saying, like, some of you are holy, and, 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 and some of you need to work on some stuff. What he's really saying is you are, every one of you, in the church, you are God's holy people. You are the true children of God. He would say it this way, if you are a child of God, and you need to hear this today, if you are a child of God, then you are holy. And I can say that with confidence because according to Paul's theology, you're not holy of your own doing. You have not made yourself holy. You are God's holy people because you are in Christ. That's why Paul, in this letter, can say to them, having never even met them, he can say to them, you are God's holy people because he knows 
He is confident in Christ, in Christ's work in their lives. So he's saying, if you really are the children of God, if you really have put your faith in Christ, then you are holy. God sees you that way. You may not feel that way right now. Your past may be too close to the present. You may still be getting over uh, you know, healing from the wounds uh, of maybe some of the damage you've done to yourself, maybe some of the damage of the people others have done to you. And so you maybe don't feel holy. Maybe you don't feel all cleaned up. Maybe you don't feel righteous. Maybe you're still dealing with guilt. Maybe you're still dealing with some of the tendencies of the old person that are in you. But understand, the Apostle Paul, and more importantly, Christ, God the Father in heaven, they look at you and they see you as holy and righteous not because uh, not by your own merit not because of anything you've accomplished on your own but because because of what christ has done in you you are god's holy people he says that with confidence so paul is writing to these young believers who are in christ who are in colossae And Paul has only one goal. We're barely going to get there today. He only has one goal. And that one goal is this, that the young Christians in the church, in Colossae, would grow in Christian maturity. As I get older, I want that more and more for you. I mean, I've always wanted that for you. I've always wanted that for you. But, but it's, it's easy, isn't it, to, to get mixed up and tripped up on, okay, what is the goal of the church? And certainly the goal of the church is to grow and see more people come to faith. Absolutely, and I want that. I want that with all my heart. But, but this desire to not only see you come on in, but to also see you grow on up, that, that, is, what, that is the one goal that the Apostle Paul has for this church in Colossae. And that is my goal and my desire for you. And so the two big questions in that would be, okay, if our goal is to grow in Christian maturity, number one, how does that happen? And number two, what does it look like? I mean, I, I, I would think that many of you right to now, today, would be like, what does that mean? How does it happen? But like, what does it look like? How, does, how do I know whether or not I am growing up in Christian maturity. We're going to spend the next two months talking about that. Let's talk about Colossae for just a little bit. Let me give you a little bit more about the city because the context will help you as we study over the next two months. Uh, it had been, and I used, I used the past tense, Colossae, the, 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 the city as a whole, had been a chief city in the Roman world, in its past. And you know why? Because it was on a main trade route. And so Colossae was an important city in the past because it was on a main trade route. Now, why do I say in the past? Because it now lives, well, not now, in that day when Paul wrote, at that moment in time, when Paul was writing this letter, Colossae was living in the shadow of another city called Laodicea. If you're a student of the Bible, you've probably heard of that city. And the trade route had been, had been moved. It had once gone through Colossae. Now it went through Laodicea. And get this, Laodicea was only about 10 miles away. In fact, I think less. I think like 9 miles away from, from Colossae. So the trade, had, the trade route had moved just a, you know, just a, just a, a, a short distance, um, for us anyway, a short distance, but when you're mostly traveling on foot, that's a big distance. And so, so now Colossae is, they, they've seen the city, they've seen their better days, the better days were in the past, um, reminds me of maybe some West Texas town or some, lots of little towns in, in, uh, in Texas where the train used to come through, but it, you know, the train isn't what it used to be, and maybe it's not a stop anymore. Now, there's still many people living in Colossae, but it was not as significant as it had been one day. And so that's part of the context, the people living and breathing and, 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 and a part of this church. Um, you know, it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't high cotton. It wasn't, it wasn't the great days, the glory days of, 
the past. Okay, back to the passage. Verse 2 there again. Um, go to the next. Well, it, 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 we don't have it on this slide, but in, in verse 2 it ends with this. It ends with grace and peace to you from God our Father. Grace and peace. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. Often when I write you uh, an email, I'll say the same. Grace and peace. Pastor Randy. What is the relationship between grace and peace? I mean, I stole that phrase from, from Paul because he uses it all the time. What's the relationship from grace between grace and peace? And if you don't know what grace is, we talked about it a lot last week in, um, in, in, in the sermon. But grace is simply God's gift to you. That's the word, charis, gift, grace. He, he gives you um, life and, and breath and sustenance and the next heartbeat and the, the, the next the next filling of your lung, and he, he gives you your job, and He gives you your health, and He gives you salvation. He gives you a home in heaven for eternity. Everything is a gift of God, this, this grace of God. What is the relationship between grace and peace? Well, the source of all peace is God's grace. Think on that for a moment. God's grace in your life enables peace or makes peace a possibility. Grace is the fuel. Grace is the source. All that God has gifted you, all that God has given you, all that God, all, everything that He has done in your life, God's grace is the fuel and the source. Even in your striving, I'm, I'm trying so hard, I'm, I'm going to try harder tomorrow, I'm going to do better tomorrow. Even in that, it is God's grace is the undergirding of that. With that, all of your trying would be failing. All of your striving would be for, for naught. Grace is the fuel and the source of all your striving. But peace is the result. The Christian who's, who's to work for some grand goal, therefore, must first pray for it. Because God's grace is the fuel by which you will achieve whatever it is that you feel God has called you to achieve. So we don't boast regarding any of our accomplishments. We, we strive and, we, and, and we, we work as someone who's, whose work is empowered by God, fueled by the grace of God. Two passages, we may have looked at both of these last week, but they're worth looking at again. When we talk, Paul says, grace and peace to you from God our Father. 1 Corinthians 15 says, but <clears throat> by, grace, by the grace of God I am what I am. <coughs> and His grace toward me, God's the, the gift, His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. By the way, he's talking about all the other, the other apostles. That's the context. I worked harder than any of them. The other 12, I worked hard. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. In Galatians 6, the same guy, the Apostle Paul, here's what he says. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Every one of us in this room, we struggle with at least internal boasting. Some of us struggle with being boastful on the outside. But most of us, to some degree, are boastful on the inside. And the Apostle Paul, the greatest church planter of all time, says, I will not boast except in what Christ on the cross has done in me. All right, and then the next section, three uh, and beyond, we're only going to eight today, three and beyond. The next section is thanksgiving and a prayer. We're going to hit, hit some highlights, and we're going, to be, we're going to be done today. First of all, verse 3, I hope you have it in front of you, but we don't have to go back and look at every verse, uh, or I'm not going to reread every, re every verse, but 
If you have it in front of you or on your phone, keep it open. In verse 3, what does Paul do? Paul informs them that he is in constant prayer for them. Now, I said this about the book uh, about Philemon. If, if uh, either Paul is actually fibbing, like, like saying that he, uh, like, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you, brother. I'll, I'll, I'll pray for you, sister. Which, like, if, we, if we're honest, like, we do that sometimes, right? Um, so either Paul is doing that, he's just like lying, or he says it enough in the New Testament for us to believe that Paul has a, an incredibly robust prayer life. He doesn't just pray for himself and maybe get around to praying for his, he didn't have kids, but maybe getting around to praying for his kids. No, he has a robust prayer life. He prays regularly for them. Now, what that probably means, what that probably means, um, I mean, it could mean they just like constantly never stops praying, but probably because he came from a Jewish tradition and because he learned this growing up, it was ingrained in him, regularly praying, that was an extension of, of the practice that he had learned from childhood. Probably what it means is that, that in the morning he would get up and he would pray. <clears throat> and he would pray for all the churches that he had that he'd influenced and he would pray for Colossae. And then, and then at noon, he would stop and he would pray again. And then in the evening, he would stop and, and he would spend an extended amount of time and he would pray again. For all the people that he claimed he prayed for, he would pray for them probably three times a day like that. Verses 4 and 5 inform the, the, the church in Colossae of, of, of what he gives thanks to God for when he prays for them. Because in verse 3, he said, I pray for you all the time. I give thanks for you. And then verse 4 and 5, so let's talk about that. What is he so thankful for? He starts with, you guys, your brothers and sisters in Christ, you're God's holy people. I'm praying for you. I'm giving thanks for you. Why? is what is the source or the topic for which he gives thanks? And he names three virtues that he highlights in many other passages. Uh, we, know these, we know these words well. They are faith, hope, and love. He says, I th- I'm thankful to God because you are a people of faith, and you are a people of hope, and you are a people of love. Now, he takes it in a slightly different order, but those are the three things, the three characteristics that they that they have. Epaphras has told him about them. They're people of faith, hope, and love. And so he, he celebrates these. Let's talk just a little bit about what these mean. First of all, they're people of faith. We can go to a different passage and talk about faith. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. That, that may have been read in your, in your wedding, right? I don't know. That's, that's, a, that's a famous passage. Paul really likes to talk about faith, hope, and love. All right, first, faith. Faith in what? Yet people say, like, I'm a person of faith. And I've come to realize that that means, especially, like, with my, and I, I mean this respectfully, I love these guys, but with my fishing buddies, when they say I'm a person of faith, that can mean a lot of different things. It, it, it could mean that they, um, it could mean a lot of different things. A lot of different religions, uh, a lot of different objects of their faith are possible when they say, I'm a person of faith. It no longer, if it ever did, it no longer means necessarily Jesus. But, but that's what Paul means when he says that, you, that they are people of faith, it in, actually includes a belief system. Not just faith in something, but faith in Jesus Christ. There's probably not a better passage that really describes that than Paul's writing to, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, I ask you today, have you done that? Have you said, yes, I, I believe that Jesus is Lord. Lord, meaning that, that He is God, and meaning that He is the boss, and, and He did what He say he'd, said He did, what He says He did. He, 
He, he defeated death and the sin and the hell and the, hell and the grave. And, and it, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul makes it clear throughout his letters that, that this faith that he commends is a faith that includes a belief, a faith in Jesus Christ. Second, uh, he deals with love. He says that they are people of love. For Paul, a sure sign of, of, of the fact that God is at work in his people is a love for all the saints. And what is the implication there? If you are not a person marked by love, then you, it's not immediately evident that you're a child of God. It is not immediately evident that you are a Christ follower. I mean, it's really that simple. It's, it's clear throughout the New Testament that, that if you are marked by love, then that is immediately evidence that this guy might be a Christ follower. This lady might be a Christ follower. From time to time, you will say to me, or I'll say to you, or we'll run into somebody and we'll say, like, that person, I just, I, I think, I think that person might be a Christian. And, and sometimes we, we say that because, like, you know, the modern day culture, they're sort of like these cultural trappings that look like, you know, like Ned Flanders or something. But, but, but really, really, when it really matters, you'll say, I think that person might be a Christian. I haven't asked her, I haven't asked him yet, but I think, and, 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 in the deepest, purest sense of our souls, what's going on there is that you're realizing this person is marked by love. And that is just inherently a trait of a Christ follower. A love for all God's people, he says to the Colossians. You, are, you have a love for all God's people. That's what he says to the Colossians. But what does he say about love in 1 Corinthians 13? Let's go back to that passage. Look at this. We've got two verses he says, love never fails. And man, if you live in a, if you live in a family where maybe you, you, uh, you hurt your family members from time to time, like that's part of being in a family, right? You, you let people down. And the most encouraging thing that we can realize together is that like, I, I fail my children sometimes. I, I fail my wife sometimes. But, but love, if I can just, if I can just, if I can just focus on love, love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where, where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. I'm skipping out of verse 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love never fails. Oh, another another, pa- another uh, translation aptly, correctly uh, says, love never ends. In the Greek, it really means both. It never fails, it never ends, it never ceases. Love never fails. Let that sink in for a moment. And what I mean by let it sink in is, this week when I was studying that, I, I said to myself, I said, I don't even know what that means. Man, does that sound good. Love never fails. God, would you help me understand what that means? Because I don't, I, don't, I don't exactly. Love never, never comes to an end. It never ceases. Prophecies, and tongues, knowledge. Like one day we'll be in heaven and like all that stuff will be like kind of part of the past because now we know completely we know everything we're with the god we uh, we don't need to prophesy anymore and yet and yet paul says but love it's still going to be there it's still going to exist it's never going to fail you let, let that let that sink in faith love and then last hope in this case the hope that paul describes seems to Focus on the object of the hope. Kind of like what I said about faith. Faith in what? Faith, faith seems to include a belief system. Hope seems to focus in this passage on the object of the hope. 
the thing one is hoping for, what, is, what it is that we are hoping in or are hoping for, he says it like this. He says, the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. <clears throat> Second Timothy uh, 4 says, Now there is, there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. What's going on here? Paul is talking two different, two different letters. What he's talking about is our hope in heaven. Our hope in like this world may fail me. In fact, it will. This building may figuratively, if not literally, come crashing down on my head. I may not complete life having, having accomplished all the goals that I've set for myself, silly as though some of them may be. I may not make it through this life without hurting some people. In fact, I already have. But my hope is in heaven. The solid facts about the future are the hope on which the believer rests. That's our solid motivation. In fact, what Paul's setting up here is your motivation to be a person of faith, your motivation to be a person of love is your hope in heaven. If we didn't hope in heaven, if we didn't think that one day, one day Jesus is going to, he's going to rescue us all and we are going to live for eternity with the Father, if we didn't believe that, there would be no motivation to be a person of faith to be a person marked by love. We would just be grabbing and getting and hoarding all that we can. And then lastly, verses 6 through 8, he explains how these things have come about, how the gospel has come to you and, and how the gospel is empowering all of your faith and hope and love. The story of Jesus that is empowering your faith and then he, he talks about how the gospel is spreading throughout the Roman world with the same results or the same characteristics being born out in the believers' lives there in Colossae. The gospel is bearing fruit. It's, it's, it's growing, not just in your little neck of the woods, Paul says, but all throughout the Roman world. In other words, what you see happening there in your little town of Colossae, in this backwoods little town, it's happening here, and it's happening there, and it's happening all over. Just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. And then finally what he says is, he says, you learned it from Epaphras. You learned it from Epaphras. A mystery, a mystery regarding your saving faith my saving faith, when we, when we actually came to believe in Jesus. I talked to, I talked to recently I've talked to someone um, who, who just became a person of faith. They, they just said, you know, I'm, I, I want to follow Jesus. I, I didn't really understand Jesus. Now I understand Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I'm a, I'm a person of faith. And what's, what the mystery of that is, it almost always involves someone else preaching, someone else evangelizing, someone else telling that story. In other words, very seldom, it, it, there's some recorded examples of this, but very seldom does somebody just come to faith just in a vacuum. It always involves, or almost always involves, a human-to-human -human relationship. I'd say it this way. A mystery regarding the work of grace in saving a person is that it usually comes to you in the form of testimony, the testimony of another believer. Someone tells someone about Jesus. I hope you find that encouraging. That if someone that you know if someone is going to give his or her life to Jesus, become a Christ follower, it may very well happen through your testimony, through your preaching, through the story of your life, 
This is an odd passage I'm about to read. The first sermon I ever preached in my entire life came out of this passage I'm about to show you. Romans 10. But it esteems this idea that, that, that if somebody's going to become a Christian, you're going to play a part in it. You're going to tell them about your story, and they're going to say, I want that. Verse, Romans 10, it says, For everyone who calls on the, on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? The significance of the one who does the storytelling. Not just the guy who gets up here and preaches. In fact, primarily not that. But the guy, the gal who tells someone about Jesus, the, the significant role that you play in that person's salvation, it's a mystery, and it is profound. And so Paul's reminding him, hey, Epaphras told you, I kind of feel like in a very righteous way, Paul is taking a little credit for the ch- fact that, that, that the, the church in Colossae exists. The significant role that your faith story has in saving grace, saving someone else, um, that cannot be downplayed. And that's what he's doing with Epaphras. He's like, I'm a faithful minister. I minister to, to Epaphras. He was saved. He came home. He preached the gospel to you. You're saved. Like, I've got my, my stamp of approval, Paul. It's like, you're saved. You're part of the family of God. I had something to do with this. Epaphras had something to do with this. And now the result of faithful preaching the result is this church. All right, today was kind of a hodgepodge of background because I want you to understand what the book is about. And then starting next week, we're going to take it a few fewer verses at a time. And we're going to talk about two things. How do we mature in Christ? And what are the markers, the evidence that we are maturing in Christ? That's what we're going to talk about. But in conclusion, here's, here's my takeaway from today's passage. Let's see if if, if you can relate. This is my prayer. Because every time we read Scripture, we're like, gosh, I need, God's calling me to change. God's calling me to reevaluate and to recalibrate and to head in a slightly different direction or maybe a totally different direction. Here are my thoughts. Number one, oh, that God's grace would empower me to pray without ending for others. Not just for myself, not just for my immediate family, but that God would empower me to pray much without ending. Morning, noon, noon and night. In, in all my life, of, of, in all my in adult life of, of pastoring churches, I have regularly had, it seems like it's often older or even elderly people that will tell me, I pray for you every day, Pastor Randy. It's not always elderly people. Some of you that are young in this room have even told me that. I pray for you every day. And I do believe that that is the fuel. That, that, is, that, is, that is the empowering. That is a conduit of God's grace in my life. Oh, that I might. Oh, that we might be that in one, another, in one another's lives. Number two, oh, that God's grace would empower me to be a man of faith in Jesus. For that is one of the thing, one of the markers in of, of this church that Paul esteemed. And then another marker, oh, that, the gra- that God's grace would empower me to love God's people deeply so that even strangers might say, are you a Christian? Because you sure act like one. Number four, oh, that God's grace would empower me to place my hope in heaven so that my hope in heaven would, would, would fuel my faith, would would fuel my love for God's people. And my last prayer, oh, that God's grace would empower me to be an Epaphras in others' lives. What I mean by that is that you would simply tell your story, your faith story to other people. Someone in the office, someone in the neighborhood, someone in your social structure. Just like Epaphras did. He went home and he said, look, I know it's going to sound crazy. I was a pagan, or uh, you, you know, you're Jewish, but 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 I've come to faith, and here's what that means. Would you like to follow Jesus? 
Oh, that this would be true in our lives, that we would pray without ending, that we would be men and women of faith, that we would love God's people deeply, that we would place our hope in heaven, and that we would be witnesses of all that God has done in our lives. Would you, would you bow? Would you pray with me? God, we celebrate your goodness today. We thank you for the, the beginning of a new book. We thank you for the encouragement that we are holy and righteous. We are your people. God, we celebrate today Jesus, his work on the cross and ultimately his work in our lives that, that allows us, causes us to be called children of, of God, calls us, causes us to be called brothers and sisters in Christ. We celebrate Jesus this morning, and that's why we come to the table of communion. So we pray this in his strong and mighty name.